The new record is called Us. Us as in two people, relationship, and us as in uh, all of us, as in uh, people. A lot of this record is to do with uh, relationship stuff, because in terms of marriage breakup, uh, and then another relationship after that, which, which also broke up. And I had to look inside myself and find out really you know, what was going on and what was going wrong. I feel it in my sex, that's the place it goes. I think the digging in the dirt image is very much about layers, you know, like a, a dog getting carried away digging in, in the earth. Well, probably the stars in the video are the snails that open the piece, but uh, there's also slugs for the underground scenes and uh, wasps and flies. And uh, maggots. <laughs> the species of snail that was used in the digging in the dirt video was one called Helix Aspersa. The snail sequence is great because it actually developed a lot further than I'd originally intended, to, intended it to, uh, mainly because Peter's such a great guy to work with and he doesn't know when to say no. They have a, a very complex jaw, um, which is a bit like sandpaper. Initially, we were just going to have snails crawling over his ear. Sandpaper moving in the way like a, a uh, chainsaw moves. Sort of didn't seem to mind that, so it started crawling over his eye. And these little uh, teeth will actually rip into flesh. And then it was crawling over his mouth. So um, that sort of scene developed a lot more. But there are also other elements to those um, shots. And some of, them, some of those are the most layered images of all, up to nine layers of, of information, all shot at different times, grass growing, creepers growing, time-lapse skies, time-lapse backgrounds, a, a whole variety of uh, different images. At one extreme, we had things shot at amazing high speed, where the film was running through the camera 500 frames every second. At the other extreme, there was just one frame taken every seven hours. Zeus was brought into the project because Peter had, had always been uh, interested in his work. And again, it was something that he felt expressed what he was trying to say. Um, he felt that Zeus's images were, were very, very powerful as being sort of um, expressions of um, the psyche. Um, slightly deranged, slightly wild. Um, and he wanted some of that element within, within the film. I was trying to get something sort of angry and murderous in a way. I was to take those characters and animate them, but because they had a very graphic style and clay animation is really three-dimensional, I had to work out some kind of characters that would communicate the essence of his characters and yet work in a three-dimensional world. By acknowledging and going through you know, the, the dark side of, of yourself, that uh, you can actually sort of come to terms with it and uh, um, accept it and, in a sense, have it neutralized a little bit.
described as hot, wet and wobbly. Steam is about the sex act. I mean, it's cut like the sex act. It was designed, it was designed to sort of mimic the pace of the sex act, the slow build up, the, uh, the climaxing. In some ways, it's the most up track on the record, I think. It's obviously got all these soul references and comes out of the same family that Sledgehammer grew out of. There isn't any illusion that you can't create. And I, I think Stephen just, just knew that and, and instinctively knew that there was, there's enough tools around now that you could solve just about any visual problem you came up with. There isn't a scene in there that doesn't have layers. You have the background and then you have the, the live action layer and then you have the animated layer and then you have, you have the mats that went into all that. We used a lot of computer animation and computer generated stuff. Just about every scene is a compositing scene. Compositing means we were layering image upon image upon image. In this song, the woman is cultured, sophisticated, and knows everything, and the man knows nothing. The only thing he really knows a lot about is this woman. It's definitely a comment on sexism. He's anti-sexism, using sexism towards women, sexism towards men. I mean, like the Chippendale scene is it's kind of a comment on how women you know, go for men's bodies, the way the steam room scene is more a comment on how men love to see women with their bodies. And we had this large discussion about the, the kind of women that we would use in the casting. All kinds of women, 
all women are great. No matter what size and shape.
of massaging of breasts going on here. Uh, that's why I had to take off. in Blood of Eden because it was the time when man and woman were in one body and uh, and in a sense you know maybe in relationship in making love that's a struggle is to to get some form of uh, merging of boundaries of some some real powerful union and um, there are many obstacles to this it's very interesting working with Peter because he likes to work as a sort of team and he likes to brainstorm ideas. So the sort of history of this video is that we've sat around and talked about his ideas, about how he sees the song, why he wrote the song. His visual ideas, because he has a lot of visual ideas as well as, you know, ideas that are... He's in very the... fertile. Yeah. He's, al <laughs> he's also very fertile. In a way, we're all sort of directing this together because... We have the artist, Zadok Ben David, who... It was, it's his world we're trying to recreate. And we have Peter, Michael and myself. Which sounds a bit shambolic, but it's actually been good fun so far. The history is that Zadok was commissioned, he was one, one artist who was commissioned to interpret the song in a, in a sculptural form, so he produced a piece for Blood of Eden. And we've used that as a sort of basis for, for the video. I really like the work of Zadok. Ben David and the simplicity and purity to the images and the way he uses figures, it's, it seems very touching and very personal. We also had the input of the theatre director Robert Lepage who's doing plans for the stage show and he knew that we were doing Blood of Eden and it's, it's a lot of people's favourite and he <coughs> spent a lot of time talking to us about how to create atmospheres in a very simple kind of way and so we chose to recreate Eden we chose to do the garden as an emotional landscape and make it very abstract because we couldn't we didn't have masses of finance to create wonderful gardens and gardens of Babylon or, so 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 we we've done it in a very kind of simple way but I think powerful but the landscape is inspired by Zadok Ben David's work and it, we've chosen to, to produce a sort of desert landscape Alex an Israeli artist, and so a lot of his influence has come into this. He, he works, he, you know, he was born in the desert, a lot of his work relates back to the desert. So we have this sort of desert Eden, and then things grow out of the landscape, instead of it being sort of, you know, trees and bushes or whatever. They're actually Zadok sculptures which grow out of the sand. So we have a tree which is made of logs of all different types of trees. So you have a kind of poplar tree, the shape of it, but it's actually made of cherry and willow and lots of other things. We've done things with models to sort of change the scale. So we have little model elements, like a, a model sort of world, like a sort of Bosch-like world. Um, and the, the sort of the trick is to sort of try and combine these sort of model elements with the real stuff and, and make it look effective. We chose to shoot against black because blue screen is still very crude, and what you tend to get is is a 
not a very nice light. You get blue light reflecting onto people's heads and things like that. So we chose to do it all in a more kind of traditional film way, where you use black as your base. We've never really met Sinead before, so we were, we were wondering what it was going to be like when she appeared. And she we ha also hadn't really seen the costumes before. I think the costume lady, Annie Simons, has been working sort of day and night for the last couple of days to finish this stuff. So when Sinead walked in in one of these costumes, it was incredible because it suddenly changed a lot of the ideas that, that we had, some of the sort of preconceptions we had. Sinead, I met in um, Chile. There was an Amnesty concert that we were both asked to do. And um, we got to talk to each other then, and, uh, and I've known her a little bit since then. And she was asking if she could sing something on this record. And I was quite pleased because I think she has a very sort of pure and emotional sort of voice, which is innocent and ballsy at the same time. So she ended up, in fact, singing on uh, two tracks, this Blood of Eden that we're hearing in the background, and come talk to me. One of the great, the great things about Sinead is her strength, her directness, her, her honesty, and dealing with a myth, which is Adam and Eve, which is a very traditional myth, which describes the fall of woman. I think you need somebody very, very strong to parody that a little, and she has the power to do that. And I, I, and I think that um, I think she's given a great interpretation of a very ancient myth in a very new way. Working with Peter is interesting because he's an artist. He works in such a way that he doesn't really sort of know what the final thing is going to be. He likes the sort of process of searching for that. It's not the conclusion. Yeah. So it's the process that he's really in interested in. And I think that's what makes him different, really, is that he's always willing to try other possibilities.
tenderness I am floating away No certainty Nothing to rely on Holding still For a moment What a moment this is Oh, for a moment of forgetting A moment of bliss I can hear the distant thunder of a million unheard souls, of a million unheard souls. Watch each one reach for creature comfort, for the feeling of their holes in the blood of Eden. I was going crazy in uh, London for a while as we were in a place with paper-thin walls. So I moved out um, in uh, 1974 and I've been out in this area ever since. I think it's much easier to, to sing songs here yeah, than talk about. For me, uh, some of the moments improvising when you just got an idea and you're singing free or even playing free are uh, the most exciting. It's very spontaneous and, and from the gut, really. Whereas once you engage the brain, it's sort of analyzing. So um, there are barriers that get in the way.
think Daniel is a great producer and perhaps one of his best qualities is his ear for magic. He knows how to uh, push me and uh, uh, both musically and lyrically and perhaps further than I might go on my own. Come Talk To Me grew out of a Senegalese groove that I'd recorded a long time back with Dudu and Jay Rose, this um, Senegalese master drummer, and uh, it was a, a groove that I, I liked a lot. We chopped up a little bit of it and added some other beats. I tried to introduce quite a lot of textures, I think. It's sort of a, more of a journey than some of the other tracks. And uh, start sing, starting off with these bank pipes, uh, something quite, so gutsy and primal about the sound of pipes. I feel that by looking in the darkness and by sort of plunging into it, diving into it, that uh, there is some uh, light at the other end of it. Um, which otherwise, if you bury, it gets uh, suppressed. So I think there's some, uh, uh, it feels quite hopeful to me, quite positive. Um, and come talk to me, there's a sort of block in communication. And, um, and in fact, there was initially uh, with one of my daughters and sort of got me going in that lyric anyway. This is so unreal. Can't you show me how you feel now? Come on, come talk to me. Come talk to me. Come talk to me. Oh, 
I was reading a book called uh, The Uses of Enchantment, and it was looking at um, a lot of fairy stories, more from a psychological point of view. And uh, I found it very fascinating through the fairy story of the, the princess learning to love the frog, getting to accept the frog, and then finding through accepting it and loving it, the prince would emerge out of it, uh, was actually a very good sort of analogy for um, an introduction to sexuality. So beneath the fairy story of Kiss That Frog is the uh, sexual underbelly. We're combining the concept of a music video with uh, a ride film, uh, one in which the chairs, the motion platform chairs, move the audience around in sync with the visual. That's the first time that's ever been done. We're actually having the chairs dance to the beat of the music at certain points as opposed to just being keyed to the visual. We're, we're using a little more esoteric abstract imagery than is usual in a ride film and uh, kind of mixing and matching and breaking all the rules. It's a lot of fun and it's exciting and it's a way of getting people inside it. I mean, I think there are all sorts of media being explored now where people are not just sitting outside observers and watching some small screen, but they're actually inside the experience and feeling it. I think this is going to provide an experience that no one will have had before, and they'll need to fasten their seatbelts.
A lot of ideas have been put forward as to why a record may or may not be successful. You know, the groove, melody, musical content, performance. But many years ago, I realized the key factor in determining the success of a record is the haircut. <laughs> <laughs> 